This vehicle does include the optional Husky package, which adds extra fur seating, howling, and hours of entertainment. If yours did not come with one pre-installed, they may also be available at your nearby installer. Hello there, this is Brian, and here is Maverick, and welcome to an episode of Vehicle Reviews. In this vehicle review, we will be reviewing the 2016 Land Rover Discovery Sport SE. I've owned two of these models now, so I feel I am in a pretty good position to give a good, honest, long-term review. In fact, it's going on six years now. So let's get started by smashing that like button and subscribing for future content. It really does help the channel. Truth be told, I really struggled with how to do this review because I have quite a bit to say about this model and brand. And to do this really, to do this review right, I feel we should first talk about Land Rover as a whole, what this car represents, and then of course my own story and experience with the Discovery Sport. So Land Rover's origins come from here. Yes, that is a Jeep. Back when GP is how you spell Jeep because it stood for General Purpose Vehicle. It was an amazing piece of engineering developed for the war. Until this vehicle, the only vehicle that you could really navigate open terrain with was a motorcycle. And while I love to ride motorcycles, they do come with a bit of risk, especially during war. And from this need came the Jeep. Okay, Brian, so what does Jeep have to do with Land Rover? Well, you see, following the war, Maurice Wilkes, chief designer of the Rover Company, a car company back then, had a leftover Jeep from the war, and he and his family would use this around their farm. Now he loved this vehicle. So in 1947, he and his brother Spencer, the director of the Rover Car Company, set about to design and build their own British version of the Jeep. And from an initial drawing in the sand, Land Rover was born. I remember watching National Geographic as a kid, and that's when I really started to fall in love with these vehicles. I always imagined myself on my own adventures of one of these, going into distant lands, and so did so many others. Now, by the late 1960s, the Land Rover Series 2 was a huge success throughout Europe and around the world. But the tide was turning for SUVs, and companies like Ford making the Ford Bronco and Jeep introducing the Jeep Wagoneer offered a combination of both comfort and off-road capability. And from that, the Range Rover was born and it was so successful. It was even featured in the Louvre as a work of art in mechanical engineering. In the 1980s, Land Rover began developing what they called Project J, an SUV that offered the utility of the Land Rover Series 3 and the comfort found in the Range Rover, basically a workhorse for the gentleman farmer. And from this project came the Discovery Series, which we have today. Now, the Discovery 1 and 2 were solid axle workhorses that also offered modern features and they became known for their off-road capability. If you've seen anything online, you've probably seen a Discovery 1 or 2 going on some type of off-road competition. But you see, as the late 1990s came along, SUV comfort became just as important and sometimes more important to consumers as off-road capability. Now, this meant a number of things, including the solid axle had to be replaced with an independent suspension. Offers an overall better ride, but often at the expense of off-road capability. In order to meet this need, the Discovery 3, LR3 in the US, was developed to bridge the gap, and it came with what is now in the iconic Land Rover all-terrain response system. Now, you see, this was a radical shift in four-wheel driving. And the reason is, is up until this point, you had to determine, do you want to be in two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive? And more often than not, if you're in two-wheel drive, that's a rear-wheel drive vehicle which struggles in pretty much any type of slippery condition. So Land Rover really pivoted in a completely different direction. Rather than forcing the driver to decide which of those modes to be in, they instead 
allow the driver to pick what terrain they're planning to drive on. And their vehicle, its advanced drive system, took care of the rest. So if you're going to drive on snow or gravel, you set it to snow or gravel. If you're going to go through sand, turn it to sand. And if you're going to go rock crawling, set it to rock crawling, and the vehicle will figure it out on its own. Sure, there's all-wheel drive systems now, but Land Rover is one of the few systems out there with their all-terrain system that allows you to actually pick what type of terrain you're going to go through, and it really shows when you drive these vehicles. So the Discovery 3 was launched in 2006 and ran until 2009. In 2010, it was given updates mostly in the area of comfort as well as a few engine changes and rebadged the Discovery 4. Now, Land Rover, the company itself, was going through quite a bit of change during this time. Now, this new direction was never more evident than in 2011 with the launch of the Land Rover Range Rover Evoque, a sleek, modern-looking SUV that completely departed from a, the traditional, conservative, squared-off design of its counterparts. The Evoque's modern design was next leveraged to the 2015 Discovery Sport. The success is more than evident. Land Rover went from selling just over 100,000 vehicles per year globally to breaking past 400,000 units within a decade. So that brings me to my part of the story. I spent over two decades working in the auto industry and had the amazing experience of working with many different brands as a corporate consultant. One of the perks was being offered amazing promotions on vehicles. In 2016, I was offered the opportunity of leasing a Land Rover Discovery Sport. I settled on the SE model as it had everything that I wanted, and I personally never saw the value of a sunroof. It included the convenience package with heated seats, the in-control system, and a power liftgate. I actually bought it before even driving it. But then something happened on the way home, driving it home, and I just fell in love with the car, which says something. I've had over 26 cars in my lifetime. I called her Victoria, and I imagined all the adventures we were going to take. There is something about driving a Land Rover that gets you to think about adventuring. And I actually started doing those things this time instead of just talking about it. I even took her to the top of Mount Washington after completing the Presidential Traverse in New Hampshire. I fully planned to purchase this vehicle out at the end of the lease and keep it for good. But then fate happened. I was sitting in traffic one afternoon and a large truck decided to drive over the front end while I was sitting in a traffic jam. It didn't total it and I was okay. It drove great after being repaired and it didn't total it, but I was worried that keeping it at lease end would be a mistake. I had other vehicles that I owned and decided it was time to move on to the next vehicle. Or so I thought. Now I love driving my Jeep which I reviewed last year and I'm an avid motorcyclist and I came so close to buying a 2000 Discovery a few months later. But I, I really miss my Discovery Sport, the way it drove, and all those little things you never see in reviews. How sandly the doors closed, how solid it felt driving on the road, knowing that it could go through just about anything, including small rivers, which I really have done on occasion. I think this is really the hallmark of a good vehicle, when you no longer have the vehicle, but the desire for it is still there. I ended up looking for a new Discovery Sport, and I finally found her, and I named her Raven. She was another SE, but literally had every possible option, including the HID headlights and fog lights. Basically an HSE without the sunroof. And since that time, I can't honestly say I've really regretted giving her a new home. Since then, I've added better tires, I installed a roof rack, and I've also been eyeing up a suspension upgrade and trailer hitch to take her out over landing. So I guess this is the part where we really start to tear down this vehicle, talking about the good, all the things you may or may not see in a normal review, the bad of which there are a few, and the things to watch out for if you decide to find one for yourself. As I mentioned, this is the 2016 Discovery Sport SE with the 2.4 liter four cylinder engine. I should have gotten the diesel. Let's talk about that later. This is the SE package. It's the entry level vehicle in the US, the HSE and HSE Luxury being the mid and upper level. The differences between the SE and HSE basically comes down to the sunroof, memory seating, mirrors, 
headlights, fog lights, slight difference in leather, the convenience package, which includes the power tailgate, passive entry, home link, and an auto dimming mirror. As I mentioned, this has the convenience pack that is standard on the HSE as well as the SE Vision Assist Pack, which adds the Xenon headlights and fog lights. It's basically an HSE without the memory seats and the sunroof. If you add the roof rack like I did for a rooftop tent, then the sunroof is a bit useless anyway. This also has the climate control pack which adds heated front seats and rear seats, heated leather steering wheel, and heated windshield. It's about as top of the line of an SE as you can possibly get. I didn't have the Xenon headlights in my first discovery and adding these made a world of difference. If you can see down here, I removed the underside to expose the front recovery hook. I often take this off road so I didn't want to fuss with it when I needed access. I added this blacked out front license plate cover as we don't require them in PA. And I also added this roof rack which I bought online went in relatively easily and has come in so handy. This has a five star safety rating. It even has a pedestrian airbag that'll deploy to protect both you and the pedestrian. It has the Land Rover pedigree and it definitely is off-road capable. I've taken it through so many different trails, including through creeks, probably about as deep as this tire, which is honestly pushing it. These air intakes are just for style, though it is a pretty good estimate of where the intake is under the hood. It comes equipped with a wireless transmitter. Functions include controlling the lights and power lift gate if equipped. These power mirrors will fold in when you lock it, and you can do this inside as well while you're driving, which is great for tight spaces. Now this has passive entry too, which means you move your hand near the door handle and it unlocks. And if someone tries to open it up without the key, it'll actually lock it on them. As you can see, this Discovery Sport also comes with the optional Husky package. If yours did not come with one, I definitely recommend researching your options. I picked up this rear liner from Amazon for Maverick to help keep things under control back here, and it has worked great. It was actually custom fitted for this model. Now underneath this liner, I have the rubber trunk mat as this does not have a third seat. It allows for a full size spare inside the vehicle rather than underneath. And this also offers space to store recovery gear. I love that this vehicle has a power release fold down rear seat feature. I just pull these tabs and the second road folds down. It's a 60-40 split but you can also partially fold down the middle section as well if you have skis or lumber. This vehicle is a turbo, which means it needs premium fuel. As you can see here, the seats fold down relatively flat. It has a fold out in the middle for, of the seat for drinks. Underneath all my wires and junk here, you can see that this has rear heated seats as well as more outlets than you may know what to do with. I also want to take a moment to talk about water seals. This actually has triple sealed doors, which will keep water out of your vehicle when water crossing. I have yet to find any water that I can go through where it gets inside of the vehicle, and it really does an amazing job. Of course, another benefit is that the ride is super quiet. Ground clearance is 8.3 inches. If you compare this to the LR3, it's, that ranges between 7.3 inches and 9.5 inches, so this falls right in the middle. There is also a spring lift available from Eibach that will add another one and a quarter inches, which I plan on adding this summer. I have found that these generally come standard with 235-60 R18 Continental Pro Contact tires, and I upgraded these to Falcon Wild Peak ATs and they definitely made a huge difference in performance. You can actually get the 20 inch rims, which I see online all the time, but I actually recommend staying with the 18s as you get better ride quality and honestly, more off-road capability. These have dual powered seats on each side. You can hold a large drink in the console and you can cover up these to deter their use, of course. The center console armrest is adjustable as you can see, this has an e-brake right here. Just like any engine compartment these days, everything is covered up. 
This is a 2 liter Ford derived 4 cylinder engine with a turbo. It realistically gets about 20 to 22 miles per gallon and gives you 240 horsepower and 250 foot pounds torque. It's the only engine you can get in this state, which is why I tire of hearing about the diesel, to be honest. A lot of people complain about this engine in terms of performance, but as you'll see later, I actually find it can really haul. And to be honest, an SUV is not supposed to be a sports car. It comes with a long-lasting AGM battery that can take a real beating before losing power. The air intake is nice and high right here. The biggest mistake I see people make when crossing water is rushing in. Land Rover recommends going as fast as necessary and as slow as possible. If you follow that, you'll be just fine. I actually have more confidence water waiting in this than I do in my Jeep. This also has a front wire heated windshield. It is a game changer. I can defrost it without running the vents, and when it's really cold, I can actually run both. I mentioned I installed the roof rack. These crossbars slide back and forth and are lockable. And the little things. The plastic cladding is detachable and replaceable in case you scratch them up off-roading, which is pretty awesome actually. As I mentioned, it has really good ground clearance. The one issue it does have is this nose reduces the approach angle, which is one of the benefits that the Defender has over this model. I haven't really bottomed out yet, but it's something to be aware of, and it's really no different than a lot of SUVs out there like its competitor, the Grand Cherokee. So, other things, there's no really front point to add a winch to this, um, like I do have on my Jeep, but you can add a winch to the rear, of course, after adding a tow hitch. One could argue that the rear winch is actually more useful if you get stuck going in, because if you went in that way, you should be able to get back out that way. Not to mention, you can also redirect using a snatch block. All right, so let's go ahead and reinstall the Husky package and I'll show you the interior. All right, there you go. Go ahead, up, up, up. As you can see, it's pretty easy for a dog to jump up here. It's not too high, which is good. And I just love this power tailgate. You just push the button and it's good to go. Now, if you kind of come back here, you can see you actually have a pretty good vision and you actually do sit higher up in the back than you do in the front. So you have that stadium seating in the back. So you can kind of see what's going on as from, from the rear and you're not just kind of stuck back out here looking out through a side window. All right, so what do we have in here? Uh, we go ahead and start it up. When you start it, you push this button and I think I saw someone from Land Rover photo album refer to this as the cool knob. And this is actually a pretty cool feature. You push this button, this go ahead and lifts up. Go ahead and turn the air conditioning off to reduce the noise, which you do like that. This has a dual zone climate control. This has the optional heated seats, which are activated in three spots here. The infotainment system, which this has as well, is pretty awesome. Um, it gives you a lot of different features. It actually, here's your main setup. When you go into here, you can also look through your rear camera, which is awesome. It's great. You can actually turn this on while you're driving. So it's not just for when you're backing up, which is great. It does work with Bluetooth, so connect directly. It doesn't have Android Auto in the 2016. So that is something to be aware of. That being said, never really felt that I missed anything. And this comes with the navigation anyway, so I don't really need that. When we hit the 4x4 i mode, this will go ahead and let you know what you're in. And which we select down here. We go down. This is your standard mode. I was in eco there. This puts me into the uh, special programs off. Basically, this gives you a uh, your normal driving mode. We go to here. This is grass, gravel, and snow. And this can go through just about anything. You can also take this through mud ruts, which I've done. I don't think I've been in videos of that, but it does really well. And this re-gears the entire suspension. This can show whether or not the lock, the, the, the diff is locking. And then, of course, there's also sand. I've also taken this out to Assateague, 10 mile long beach down in Maryland and Virginia. You can take your vehicles out into along the shore. And this thing did flawlessly, did not hesitate or get stuck in any possible way. So this has a hill descent control, which you turn off on there. Trash control gets turned off on one here. This has the wire, which I don't know if you can see in here, but this has a wire 
defroster within the windshield. It also has your standard defroster, so if you really needed to, you could actually activate both at once. This is a heated steering wheel. Gosh, I tell you, I think I actually enjoy this heated steering wheel more than I enjoy the heated seats, to be honest. Automatic rear dimming mirror. Um, of course, little things here like sunglasses, your in control app, which I guess I should mention, that's actually one of the coolest things about this vehicle, which I don't ever see reviewed. So if you get the in control app, this is such a handy feature. First of all, if you have more than one vehicle, you can name your vehicles. My first one I called Victoria. This one I've named Raven. Um, it'll let you know the range you have. It'll let you know where you are. Right now I am outside of Nakamixon State Park in Pennsylvania. Um, so this has a built-in GPS, which means if someone does take your vehicle, you can locate this uh, using the GPS. So it has a built-in theft recovery system has remote start and you can set the temperature to however you want to set it before you get in. It also has has a journey feature. We'll let you know if you're driving, uh, you know, what you went to and what map you went to and all that type of stuff. I love this. I use this so much in the winter. I can go, no, actually not just the winter, but I actually probably use it more in the summer. If I'm coming back from a hike and it is hot as heck, this vehicle's gonna get hot. So I can, before I get back to the vehicle, up to about 30 minutes out, I can remote start this and cool down the entire interior before I get in. And I just love that about this vehicle. Oh, and the other thing I should mention about this too is this is good. So if you have more than one driver, you don't have to have more than one key fob. They just need a cell phone and to log into the account. And if you have more than one vehicle, it's $120 a year, but it's for any Land Rover. So you have more than one Land Rover in your family with the InControl app. This allows you to go ahead and do that. So now the big thing, how does this drive, right? This is really one of the main reasons you buy this vehicle. So before I start out, let me switch this over to the four wheel drive. Now this isn't really a true off-road test of the vehicle, but let's go ahead and take it out. Um, you can see out here, it's pretty icy. Um, you're actually allowed to drive through here. This is an extended parking lot. So let's go ahead and take it through the ice. I have it in just the normal mode. Let me go ahead and switch it over to the grass, gravel, and snow. And as you can see, as I start going through this, it's, well, it normally is in, uh, go a little bit quicker here. You can see that it's sensing some issues. And as it goes, I am having no issues at all driving through this. Um, it's doing quite well. So let's go ahead and take it a little bit further out. And you can see it only engages the diff as needed. And it actually tells you what direction your wheels are going as well, too. Most of the time, actually, this will just leave itself in two-wheel drive. It's pretty rare that um, you need to put this into four-wheel drive um, or where it actually locks it in all the way. But I have been in those situations and it excels in those situations. What I actually like about this more than my personal Jeep Wrangler is that this kicks in automatically without me feeling it and it has a direction sensor so if the vehicle is driving and it starts to swerve like this it'll automatically keep me straight and i don't even know it um and that's actually a not just why you're going straight but if i'm going around a curve really hard and it senses i'm losing direction it'll actually go ahead and adjust the braking so it keeps me in line and on the same angle that i'm trying to turn um, which not only actually obviously gives you great performance, but this also gives you great safety. It's one of the reasons it is rated a five-star vehicle. Um, it's a pleasure to drive. When I bought this, I always wanted a Land Rover. I think growing up as a kid, I used to always watch where, you know, they're out in National Geographic. Geographic. They're out in the old Land Rovers before they were called Defenders. They were just the Land Rovers. Um, and they would take them out on the African Safari. And I always wanted those as a kid and of course you know the the defenders are nice we they stopped making them over here in the u.s i believe in 1997 so if you're watching this overseas that's why you know people say well just get a defender well you really can't get a defender and the brand new defenders just came out um i think for your money though i think the discovery is actually a better option the discovery when it originally came out and that's sort of what this is this gives you all the luxury but it doesn't overwhelm you saying wow this is luxurious but everything feels solid Everything feels well-crafted, uh, well-made. It's just a quality vehicle. So we recently had a snowstorm. So I wanted to take it out on some bad roads in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. 
This is just off the icy Delaware River, where George Washington famously crossed the river over to Trenton. Temperature-wise, it's around 5 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 15 degrees Celsius. And some of these roads are rough. But as you'll see, we're going to have zero issues in this vehicle. At this point, we are departing the safety of paved roads for snow and ice pack covered gravel roads. Really no shoulder to spare on some of these areas, and this handles just fine. More than fine, actually. Land Rover just really understands these conditions. It's just baked into their DNA. I think part of that is the setup itself. It's a front wheel drive vehicle that can fully send power to each individual wheel using state-of-the-art tech. Now I know, you're right, driving on snow is easy. What about stopping? That is where this vehicle delivers in spades. Notice how the directional sensor in this ABS system just keeps your vehicle from losing control while hard braking, even in some of the most difficult conditions. This is actually one of the things I appreciate most when I'm driving this vehicle. So you're still not convinced. Well, my wife and I were out driving in one of the worst storms in the Northeast last year. Why? My wife would probably tell you that I am a knucklehead and she would be right. So in my wisdom, I decided to take us down one of the most difficult gravel roads in the area, Bunker Road. And yeah, it has a creek crossing. Not to mention six to eight inches of snow. Creek crossing, no bridge. So let's just go ahead and see how I did versus the Land Rover. This should be interesting. Oh, I got a bar. I got a bar. I got a bar. Have we been on all these roads before, pretty mm -hmm. much? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just, house up on just, just now with this much snow. We do. We find to meet dead zones. Well, yeah, that's my specialty. I try to find dead zones. Let's try some Texas's to my dad. See, you like how there's just no road in between here? There's no road because apparently you just drive through the creek twice. Uh, Looks like you just follow the creek. What do you think? I have no idea. It's hard to tell because it's like wet. I mean, it just looks like... Yeah. I'm gonna take a look. I'll bring it back. Okay, I'm gonna wait here. Why don't you wait here? I'm gonna wait here with Maverick. Uh, I'm gonna see what the creek looks like. Just so you know, I just about missed that. I Where'd think I, I think I saw the tail end of you go down. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I was I, like, wow. I'm not sure. I mean, I we could probably do it. Okay. But. So ultimately, we decided better safe than sorry. And the next morning, I took Maverick out on a nice winter hike. That being said, I haven't really found anything this workhorse could not get through. It's about as good as you're going to get in performance and handling in rough stuff. Now, of course, anytime you're in a Land Rover, one of the first things people are going to say is, oh, a Land Rover, they're unreliable. They're going to cost you an arm and a leg. You know, I knew some guy who, uh, or I had a Land Rover once, and it, and he had to replace the engine, and he had to replace this and that, and oh, it was the, it was the worst vehicle we ever had. I've heard these horror stories, yet every single person I've talked to, not on some type of internet chat that claims these, loves these vehicles. 
um, and they say how reliable they are. I mean, sure, back in the old days, maybe there were issues. And I think, you know, I think where the issue is that you come in with Land Rover com people complaining is that these are expensive luxury vehicles. And if you buy an off-road vehicle that's been driven heavy and not well-maintained, it's not going to be, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a Toyota, it could be a Honda. In my lifetime, I've owned 26 different vehicles. Yes, 26. Uh, they've include Hondas, Toyotas, Mazdas, uh, Audis, Volkswagens, Ford, Chevys, Chryslers, you name it, I have owned it, even Jeeps, right? Um, and this is among the most reliable vehicles I've had. I have not had, I've had two of these now. I've driven a combined, uh, I think 98,000 miles between the two of them. And I think the only issue I had is once the, there was a slight fault that was under warranty for this and there was also an O2 sensor that went bad that was covered under warranty and that was it. That's the only thing I've had really go wrong with this vehicle. Um, it's been a pleasure to drive. It's never left me stranded. It, you know, I think the other thing too is if you ever do run across an issue, not just Land Rover, but any vehicle, you should get on top of that right away. If you, for example, uh, the battery on this finally wore out, it's about six years old, it takes an AGM battery. Now, I could do two things. I could let that battery keep on draining down and draining down, but as soon as it starts going and it starts letting me know, hey, every time I get in the morning and the, the battery says, I could probably go maybe another five, maybe six months on that, right? But as if I do that, that's going to cause extra strain on the alternator. It's little things like the oil changes. If I do the oil changes on this with synthetic um, and I get them done when they're supposed to be done, these things, they'll keep on running. It's a good engine in this vehicle. And the transmission too. I, I think, you know, Land Rover will tell you that the transmission on this vehicle is uh, non-maintenance. You don't have to do anything to it. And that's true up until usually 100,000 miles because after 100,000 miles, any automaker, I worked in the auto industry for a long time at the corporate level as well as the retail level. And what they don't tell you is when they say it doesn't require any maintenance, it doesn't recover, recover it doesn't require any maintenance while they're concerned with the vehicle. And when they're, they're concerned with the vehicle up until at most 80 to 100,000 miles. So if you do, if you should be doing a differential change um, before then, well, they say, well, you know what? Well, we're not going to put that on the books. And the reason they do that is because there's a lot of things people shop on. They shop on the price. They shop on reliability. They shop on how the vehicle drives. Is it a fun vehicle? Another thing that they will do is they will go ahead and they'll look at the cost of ownership. And if they can reduce the number of service uh, visits or maintenance you have to do for a vehicle over the lifetime, that reduces the cost of ownership. Don't fall into that trap. Um, any type of all-wheel drive vehicle, whether it's Land Rover or Jeep, get your differential fluids changed every 50,000 miles. If you do that, your automatic transmission and your four-wheel drive are gonna last a long time. Um, in fact, this vehicle already has been known to hit 200,000 miles if you just keep on changing the fluids in this vehicle. Um, and honestly, if you get 100,000 miles out of a vehicle, I think you've done well. Now, I think where you get a lot of people complaining about with the reliability of Land Rovers is because these are expensive vehicles. You'll get people that'll buy the second or third owners with maybe 80 to 100,000 miles. Um, and they'll drive, they'll expect to drive that for another 80 to 100,000 miles, you know, maintenance free. And then when it breaks down, you know, what were you expecting? Or even worse, I see people online buying all the time, for example, LR3s right now, 2006 LR3s, which are, gosh, what, 16 years old with 180,000 miles. And, you know, then people complain when the transmission goes or the airbag goes or this goes. A lot of these things are wear items that do wear over time. So what should I look for if buying a used Discovery Sport? Maintenance records. And if they don't have them, that's fine. Ask them if they've had the transmission service. Where do they take it for service? Have they replaced anything lately in the car? If they have, they're probably going to tell you because they probably think it's going to make it worth more. If a person hesitates on this and it has over 50,000 miles, that's when I would start to worry.
Understand that higher the higher mileage you go, the more you may end up paying in long-term upkeep. And definitely do a vehicle history check. Land Rovers are expensive, and it's next to impossible to total the Mountain New. Be wary of one with bad history report where they said it was nothing major. The accident on my first one ran $18,000 in repairs without totaling it. And someone bought the vehicle at a dealer. So just make sure you take your time and find the right one. So what do I ultimately think of this vehicle? Well, for pros, it's fun to drive. It's safe. It can get you through just about anything. It has loads of utility and features out the wazoo. The list really goes on and on. The fit and finish is, a sta is outstanding. And despite what people say, it has pep and it drives great. Cons. They can be expensive when buying newer and factoring in maintenance in older ones. It costs $1,500 alone just to replace the brake pads in this. Oil changes aren't cheap unless you do them yourself. Be prepared to be hit with negativity from other Land Rover owners online. It seems to me it's like polar opposite of the Jeep community in some aspects. There are more off-capable vehicles and definitely more economical choices. Though for me, this really hits that sweet spot. It can be hard to find a good mechanic. These aren't as common in the states and there are only five dealers in all of Pennsylvania. And in some states, there are no dealers. That being said, try and support your local shops. Just like anything, any vehicle really, small things can lead into big problems. So stay on top of anything. Overall, I think it's a great vehicle. I keep trying to talk Pepper into getting an Evoke to help round out the fleet. And I really see myself holding on to this for another 15 years. I think it's a perfect overlander and I'm really looking forward to testing that out this summer on the Transamerica Trail. So stay tuned for that. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this review. It is a bit longer than most, but I did have a lot to say, didn't I? I hope you enjoyed it. So please click the like button if you did and subscribe for future content if you haven't already. I hope to see you again in another video. Until then, take care and I encourage you to head out into the indoors and find your own amazing adventures. Take care.